today I'd like to talk about the book of Job and read it as a piece of literature as well as a piece of scripture and take it independently of its scriptural meaning, look at the way in which ideas are organized in it, and try and look at the, the message that it has for us in the way that we might look for a certain sort of didactic message in certain kinds of pieces of literature. Now the book of Job was written into the Hebrew Bible at the time that the, Bible was, that the Hebrew Bible was formed, roughly a thousand or eight hundred years before the time of Christ. It took a number of generations to actually codify it, and in fact the book of Job harks back to an ancient tradition in the Near East that goes back from many centuries prior to the organization of the Hebrew Bible. It's part of the, the sort of common heritage of wisdom literature that we find in the ancient Near East. In that respect, it's comparable to the story of Noah and the Ark, which we find also in the earlier traditions of the ancient Near East prior to the organization of the Bible itself. Now, the book of Job illustrates one of the main or perhaps the foundational stance towards being of the religious person. In other words, it has a message which is timeless. It answers and it asks and answers a question which all human beings by the very nature of the human condition have to be forced to confront. And the question that the book of Job asks and tries to answer is, what's the point of evil? Where does evil come from? How do we account for evil? In a, in a world that's run by God, by his almighty providence, that's been created by a completely good being, why is it that we have suffering and pain and misery? And more importantly, why is it that it seems that sometimes bad things happen to good people? Why is it that the virtuous and the righteous should suffer along with the evil? It's understandable, perhaps, if God were to send down some sort of chastisement for our own sins. That seems to have a certain kind of justice to it that we fairly readily comprehend. And yet, sometimes, I mean, and we've all seen this in our own lives, sometimes bad things happen to good people. And that forces us to a sort of crisis of faith. It forces us to ask questions of God or ask questions of ourselves. How is it that we can continue to believe in God's providence, in an almighty and omniscient and all good being who yet sends unmerited suffering into our lives and into the lives of the people around us? Now, just by the very nature of the human condition, people have been asking this for centuries. If you look back, say, um, over to something like Milton's Paradise Lost, the whole point of Paradise Lost is what we call theodicy, the justification of God's ways to man. And the book of Job inquires into the problem of whether it's possible to justify God's ways to man, and what would count as such a justification, and how we're able to kind of reconcile our understanding of God's providence with the problem of evil and with our own sinfulness. So let's, let's consider the, the, the story of Job itself. Now, there's a very small cast of characters in the book of Job. We have God, who has the qualities of being the Old Testament deity. He's omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's all good, he's running all of history, not a sparrow falls without his consent, the usual attributes of, of the, the creator. In addition, we have Job himself. Now, Job is described as a righteous man. He is righteous to those around him, he shows appropriate respect to the deity, he, and as a consequence of his goodness and his righteousness, he's been blessed by God with health and wealth and family and all the good things that life offers a human being in this world. His wife, something of a religious skeptic, plays a small but important part in the story of Job, and he also has three friends who come and help him during, or come and try and commiserate with him during his sufferings, and they, I would say, are theological wannabes. Job's three friends are those people who claim to be wise enough to understand God's providence, to be able to comprehend his mysteries and comprehend his purposes. Particularly, Job's friends are the sort of people that think they understand the ways of God and believe that they can justify these ways to man. Finally, there is Elihu, kind of a, a mysterious figure, perhaps an angelic figure, who represents kind of real wisdom with regard to the divinity, real theological wisdom, which says there's only so much you can understand about God. At a certain point, you have to say, I submit to the will of the Almighty. I, I'm not in a position to understand such things. And Elihu forces Job to the point where he is willing to acknowledge the fact that we cannot entirely comprehend God's ways and that it's this inscrutable mystery of the way God organizes the world which the book of Job tries to reconcile us to.
In other words, the book of Job asks or covers a, a, a familiar human theme. Why is there evil in the world? And the answer the book of Job gives us is, don't ask. <laughs> right? It's a dumb question, and the answer is even dumber, and that's about as far as you're going to get with this. Well, let's think about it. Um, let's start from the very beginning. The first scene, or it's not entirely a scene because we haven't really got a location, we, are, we see God in heaven and he's surrounded by the angels and people who are described as the sons of God or the hosts of God. The idea is that we're up in heaven with God and his other various angelic creatures. And among these creatures, for reasons that are not very clearly explained, is Satan, the evil one, the lord of darkness, prince of evil, all that kind of business. Now, the book doesn't really explain to us what Satan is doing in heaven. And I imagine that there's all kinds of theological problems involved in figuring that out. Those of you who like to ponder this sort of thing, write me and let me know if you do manage to find out. I was myself never able to comprehend it. Even stranger is the fact that God and Satan are having a conversation, which is kind of strange, but okay, let's play along with the, the, the myth. Satan and God are having a conversation, and God pipes up, apparently, without prior discussion of him and says, have you seen my friend Job, my good and faithful servant Job? Among all the people in the world, I really like Job. He's a great guy. What's great about him is the fact that he shows fear of the Lord. He's kind and generous and good towards those around him. And as a consequence of that, I've blessed him with all kinds of good things. Satan retorts, well, of course he's good and, and praises you and shows fear of the Lord. You've given him all this great stuff. You gave him health. You gave him wealth. You gave him family. You gave him everything a human being could possibly want. If you gave me everything a human being, or perhaps an angel, could possibly want, I think we could make a deal. But naturally enough, the only reason that Job praises you, the only reason that Job is God's faithful servant, is because of the fact that you've given him these things. In, uh, in terms of the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, you might say that Job's love of God and reverence for God is heteronymous. In other words, it's not free. It's in exchange for the good things that God gives him. And Satan says, look, this is essentially, this is heteronymous love. Right? It's the kind of respect that you give towards somebody that's going to, ben that's going to benefit you later on. And uh, what, there's a cynical saying once, uh, someone once said that uh, gratitude is the expectation of future rewards. Well, okay, what Satan is essentially saying is that you've given him all this great stuff, so naturally he praises you, he hopes you're going to give him some more good stuff. A very cynical interpretation of religious devotion. So God says to Satan, oh no, that's definitely not the case. He's God's faithful servant. He's a good and righteous man. And Satan says, no. And God says, yes. And they go back and forth a little bit. And ultimately he says, well, Satan says, well, I'll tell you what, let me test him. Let me take away these good things from him. Let me take away his family. Let me take away his health. Let me take away his wealth. If I do that, he will curse you. You will see that Job really doesn't love you autonomously. He doesn't love you from the very depths of his being, independent of anything you can give him. He loves you only for the benefits he's received from you. And God says, okay, go ahead. Do whatever bad stuff you want to him, but don't touch his body in particular. Just take away from him the things that I've given him. So down goes Satan into the world of space and time among us, goes to Job's family, kills the family, sends in uh, invaders to kill his flocks, kill his sons, kill his daughters, destroy his house, make him wretched and miserable, take away the many good things that God has given him. Well, up he comes to heaven, and they both look down, and we see Job, a miserable man who's found that he's facing all sorts of calamities. He's lost his family, and he weeps for it. He's lost his house. He's lost his flocks. He's a wretch. He used to be a, a man who was very well off, and now he's down in the depths of poverty and misery, and he's lost a great many emotional ties. But he refuses to curse God. He refuses to blaspheme and refuses to say, I don't, like, I don't love God anymore. I no longer show fear of the Lord. Job, it turns out, at least as far as this goes, is God's faithful servant. And Satan and God have a little back and forth about this. They say, well, look, I was right. And of course, God is always right. One of the points you'll, you'll find out in this story is that God, being God, is always right. And also, another thing you'll find out is that the sort of person that has arguments with God is really a, manifest, is really a personal manifestation of satanic pride. In other words, what sort of a person would argue with God? Well, you can't win an argument with God. He's God, after all. He's always right. So if you are on a different position, or if you uh, make a different argument 
that departs from the one that he makes, by definition, you're wrong. The deity is always right. He knows everything. He is all powerful. What's the point of having an argument with God? Well, that's a question that perhaps only Satan would completely understand. But being the satanic evil figure that he is, he continues the argument with God. And he says, look, the reason why he is not blaspheming now the reason why Satan is not cursing God or why he maintains his religious fidelity is because he really didn't care about his family and wealth isn't all that important. What he really cares about is his own hide. If I were to go down there and send all kinds of afflictions to him personally, physical misery, pain, wretchedness, then he would blaspheme. Before he expired, he would say, I hate God, I curse God, I wish that God had never existed or I wish that I had never been born. So God says, okay, go ahead down and do that. Now let's pause for a minute here before we go on to the, the rest of the narrative. It's very hard to understand what's going on up here in heaven. In other words, how did Satan get up there? Number one, doesn't get explained. Number two, what's the point of having an argument with God? Because you always lose arguments with God, he being God and you being something else. And number three, why doesn't God just squash Satan like a bug? In other words, why does he let Satan do stuff like this? He must have something in mind, being God, and since his providence runs the whole world, there must be something that this does that, God, that, that satisfies God's desires for the world or is part of God's general plan for the world. So we have to confront the question of why it is that God allows Satan to come down into this world, which is another way of saying, why does God create evil? Why does he allow a world in which evil happens? And one of the things that makes Job a, a universal piece of literature, independent of your religious beliefs, and regardless of whether you believe in God or not, is that people have a kind of gut reaction to the fact that suffering is a real thing, and that often, especially when we see suffering in, among ourselves, or among our family, or even among our friends, people we know, or even anonymous people on the other side of the world, you wonder to yourself, if God really is there, why does he do things like this? What's the point of, of sending you know, childhood diseases that kill children? Why are there wretched accidents like earthquakes or hurricanes that kill people for no obvious reason? Why do these calamities occur in a world that has moral order to it? In other words, if you want to put it metaphorically, why does God let Satan down into the world? Why did God create Satan being an all good and all wise thing? Difficult, perhaps insoluble problems. Well, down comes Satan, All right, we, regardless of why God sends him in. He's calling the plays, and down he comes. And he covers Job with terrible boils and sores from the tip of his toe to the top of his head. He's covered with these loathsome sores. And remember, of course, since we're talking about the ancient Near East, medical science is not very far advanced. And even today, medical science can't solve all the afflictions that hit the human body. And Job is just sit, forced to sit there and suffer. And he sits among the ashes, and his family, except for his wife, is dead, and his flocks are destroyed, and his house is destroyed, and he has none of the things left that God had given him originally. But Job is God's faithful servant. And Job just stays there and says, although I've been afflicted with many great things, or with many evil things, I will not blaspheme. I am still God's faithful servant. And his wife says to him, what do you mean you're still God's faithful servant? What good is this doing you? I mean, God was nice to you before, and I can understand the point of religious devotion at that point. But now that God has killed our children, now that God has destroyed our property, now that he's taken away our house, and now that he's done this terrible thing to you, just curse God and die. It's one of the most cynical and kind of perhaps bitterest um, negations of the human condition, or at least negation of that element in the human condition which entails suffering. Job's wife has the position of the kind of ultimate religious skeptic, the kind of person that's willing to go along with the forms of religion while things are going well, but when the going gets rough, Job's wife says, curse God and die. And Job says, that is wicked. I will never do that. I will never curse God. I will certainly die because all of us die. But to curse God is past the pale. I won't go beyond that point. No, I am God's faithful servant. I'll sit here and know that my suffering was unmerited because I didn't do anything wrong, but what is it? Man disposes and God, uh, man proposes and God disposes? Well, God has sent this. I will accept this with the appropriate religious humility, and 
I will not curse God. I'll curse the day I was born. I'll curse my existence. I'll say that I wish that I was dead and that I, don't, that I wouldn't have to do this anymore, that I wouldn't have to put up with the suffering, but I will not curse my Creator. I will not curse the Almighty. Now, it's worth noting here that God was right from the beginning. In this little dispute between God and Satan, it turns out that God was right. And at the end of the story, we'll find out that in all disputes between God and anybody else, God is the heavy favorite. As a matter of fact, he's not just the heavy favorite, he's always right. It's a, it's a sure bet. All right? The big message, or one of the big messages we ought to learn here is that in all our contests with the deity, if we hold any view beyond that which God endorses, we're wrong. The closest we can come to virtue and to righteousness and to a correct understanding of the world is to align our views and desires and hopes and aspirations with those of the deity. When we understand, or when we, when we believe we understand his ways, well then that's just fine. We acknowledge God's sovereignty and we go about our business. When we believe we don't understand his ways, the proper thing to do is to accept God's providence with the appropriate humility. You don't understand everything, well you have to learn to live with that. That's just part of the human condition. That's one of the reasons why this is part of what's called the wisdom literature of the Old Testament and why it's not just restricted to the Hebrews or to the Christians or to the Muslims. Rather, it's a universal fact or a universal fact which is organized in this universal religious and literary text. Well, Job is good, faithful, patient. Oh, the patience of Job. You can see where that, that, that cliche comes from. Who's more patient than this? He puts up with all kinds of stuff. Anything bad that can happen to a person happens to him. And still, he says, I'm God's faithful servant. And God was right. Well, in order to commiserate with him and to help him in his affliction, three friends of Job show up, and they sit down with him, and they lament his condition. They say, look at Job and say, wow, I knew you when. I knew you when you were rich. I knew you when you were happy. I knew you when you were a family man. I knew you when you were healthy. And now here we are not quite around your bedside at your, in your hospital room because there's no such thing then, but here we are sitting in the dust with you. You're covered with these boils. Your wife wants to blaspheme God and has blasphemed God. She'd like you to blaspheme God and then die. And we're here to do whatever we can for you, Job. And Job's three friends are wise men, but their wisdom is human wisdom. Their wisdom is the, the wisdom of those people who hope and believe that they're able to calculate God's purposes and come to an understanding of what God wants for human beings. And in particular, they believe that they are able to plumb the depths of the greatest mystery of theology, which is why there is suffering and why God sends evil into the world. They offer various possible plausible theological accounts of why God has sent suffering to Job. Part of the explanation, or one, one, one explanation that they offer is that Job you really are an evil man. You've committed some, some hidden sin which, you have, which no one has caught you in and God has sent you righteous retribution for this. And Job says, no, hold it. You know me and you've known me all my life. I've been a righteous man. I don't do evil to my fellow man. I don't do evil to God. I don't blaspheme. I have, insofar as it's been possible, always done the morally correct thing. So Job says, you may think that I've committed some secret sin, but in fact I know in my heart of hearts I have not. The reason you're inventing this doctrine of secret sin and therefore just retribution is because you want to fit God into some form that you've created because the incomprehensibility of the divinity is just too much for you to handle. The fact of the matter is that I am an innocent man. I have done no evil. So don't tell me that I've done wrong because I know full well that I haven't. Silence is one of his friends. Another friend says, well, perhaps this is a kind of family thing. Perhaps your sons or daughters or your ancestors or somebody in your family has committed some sort of sin. And perhaps the idea of guilt is collective rather than individual. Perhaps you're paying the freight for some sin that somebody else committed. And Job says, no, I don't know about the sins of other people, but I know that I personally have not done any such thing and that, that God wouldn't do some such thing as that. That's not the reason why this is happening. Another says, well, perhaps you've sinned in the eyes of God, but haven't really understood the fact that you've sinned. And perhaps it's an unintentional or un misunderstood sin. Job says, no, it's not like that. I've done what I ought to have done. Job continues to maintain his blamelessness. And there's a, a whole series of back and forth discussions about what could possibly be the origin of Job's troubles. And Job continues to maintain his innocence. 
And the friends are now kind of grasping at straws. They're looking around trying to say, well, look, there's got to be some rational explanation for why God would send such evil to you. He doesn't send it arbitrarily. And Job says, yes, he does. Have you looked around at the world? And here's part of the wisdom in this literature. He says, often it turns out that people who do evil prosper. And we all know that as a matter of practical fact, when we look around in the world, there are people who do evil repeatedly again and again and again, and they continue to do well. They cheat at cards and they continue to, get to win. They never get caught. They steal and they never get arrested. They do all manner of evil and God never sends them retribution here in the world. And yet, if you're honest, you must also agree that there are some people that we see in the world that, that engage in no obvious transgression, that don't do anything that's clearly evil, and nonetheless, they are sent terrible afflictions. In other words, it seems as though God gives out rewards in this world promiscuously, independent of the moral value and the moral behavior of the person involved. Sometimes good people suffer, and sometimes bad people prosper. And that's just the fact of the matter. Now, this is a problem. It could easily make a person lose their faith in God. It is a, re a real moral test, perhaps the greatest test of faith that there is. Because if our God is a loving God, and an all-powerful God, and an all-knowing God, why is it that he would tantalize us and torment us with unrequited virtue? And why is it that he would reward people who are obviously evil? Why is it that Stalin managed to die in bed and was never assassinated? He killed millions of people. Why is it that sometimes little children get run over that are obviously innocent? This is a great test of faith. And Job's friends, the theological wannabes, the would-be practitioners of theodicy, are those who are only able to hold on to their religious faith by concocting some sort of pseudo-rational explanation for the ways of God. In other words, they fit God into some preconceived mold that is consistent with the canons of human rationality. And by doing so, they reconcile themselves to the apparently promiscuous giving of, of rewards and punishments by saying that it's really not promiscuous, it's really not arbitrary. In fact, there's some deep secret about these rewards and punishments which I have discerned, and that means essentially that I have finally understood God's purposes in the world. I understand why God runs the world in, which, in the way that he does. Now Job flatly contradicts this. He says, look, one of the worst things that you can do is to place yourself in a position of judging God. Now I think of myself blameless, but I'm very, very skeptical about the theological pseudo-explanations which my friends are giving here. Each one of them has offered some apparently reasonable account of why I suffer. But I know, first of all, that that's not true, that I haven't committed any transgression. And in fact, I think that God just is arbitrary and promiscuous in the way he kicks things, in the way he gives out suffering and, and pleasure. I don't know why he is that way, but I continue to remain God's faithful servant. Now, Job represents a certain kind of what I'll call a stance towards being. Every philosophy, not just religious philosophies, but also atheistic philosophies, uh, general approaches to the world, have some sort of foundational bedrock, some foundational approach to the, the facts of human life. And suffering is one of those facts of human life. All humans will experience suffering, and if the suffering is intense enough, they will at some point in time say, why me, God? Or if they're not, not religious believers, why me, universe? But in any case, they have to ask, why me? Or why my child? Or why my parents? Or why my brother or sister? We're all forced to ask that question simply by the, the nature of the human condition. Job's stance towards being is one of absolute fidelity to the word of God. He is God's faithful servant who will not blaspheme under any circumstances, even those which are most trying to the human soul. This, I would say, is in some respects the marrow of religious faith. And I think this marrow of religious faith, this complete submission to the will of God, is not restricted to any one religion. It's, I think, the marrow of Old Testament religiosity, but I think it also has a lot to do with the religiosity of the New Testament or the Quran. In other words, if you believe in God and you believe that he has a providence which governs the world, then whether you understand that providence or not, the appropriate response is God gives this to us, well, and I will accept it. I do not blaspheme God. I do not presume to judge him. Now, the problem with Job, 
is that although he has adopted this stance, he hasn't fully worked out the implications of this. He continues to maintain his own righteousness, which makes God seem evil, for want of a better word. Now, the idea that God seems evil means that we have to stress very much, perhaps italicize the word seems, because for God to be evil is a contradiction in terms. It doesn't make any sense. If you believe in God, it doesn't make any sense to have him be good some of the time and bad some of the time. That's not the nature of the deity. If you believe in the God of the Bible, God of Abraham and Moses, God of Christ, or the God of biblical religion as a whole, you have to hold the view that whatever he does, it's always good. And yet we're faced with the paradox, the very wrenching fact that there's no obvious reason for it. Why should my child get run over? I mean, I believe in God, but I still can't account for this. Well, Job is left with, is stuck in that situation. He can't account for God's organization and running of the world, and yet he maintains his position as God's faithful servant. He rejects his, and rebukes his wife. He says, I will not blaspheme God. I will not curse God and die. Well, Job continues to maintain his own righteousness. He continues to say, God sent this to me for no reason, or no reason that's obvious to anyone. And Eventually, throughout the course of oh, 50, or, um, 50 or 60 responses and uh, comebacks, kind of a, a, a long dialogue between Job and his friends, they are eventually silenced. And they're silenced for two reasons. One, because they have not managed to convince Job that he is somehow sinful, that he is somehow the author of his own evil, and that God is just requiting Job's evils in an appropriate and just way. Job continues to believe he's blameless. He actually engages, he, uh, he swears 16 oaths to the various things that he's done properly and the righteousness and the righteous behavior that he is always engaged in and says that as far as he knows, there is simply no reason why God would respond to his behavior in this way. There's no reason why he should be punished for sins he didn't commit. Job's friends are silenced. They say, wow, he thinks of himself as justified. And in addition to that, the more we think about it, the more hollow and the more implausible and in some respects, the more presumptuous our theological explanations become. None of them are really satisfactory to account for the problem of evil in the world. We might say that the book of Job is the most anti-theological book ever written. Now, anti-theological is not the same thing as atheistic. In other words, it's one thing to believe in God, and another thing to believe that you understand what he's doing with the world. One involves, the earth, first, uh, believing God involves simple and direct and fundamental religious faith. The second involves a sort of Promethean or uh, satanic pride, the idea that you are able, with your limited and finite mind, to comprehend the workings of the, div of the divinity, that you really understand why God has organized his providence in the way that it is. So what turns out to be the case is that Job silences his friends. He manages, if not to convince them, at least to shake up their pat and easy answers to the problems of suffering and evil, and to maintain the fact that although he, wish, that he wishes he were dead and that he hopes to die very soon, he will not blaspheme, but he really has no idea why God sent this. And apparently, or seemingly, God sends evil into the world arbitrarily, which would seem to undermine our, our conception of the all-good, omnipotent, omniscient deity. Now here we get, at the end of this colloquy between Job and his three friends, we get a kind of mysterious figure, perhaps an angelic figure, a young man, Elihu, rebukes Job and he says, listen Job, I've, I'm a young man and I think it appropriate for the young to learn from the old from the wise, from people who have managed to absorb wisdom over the years. So throughout this discussion, I've kept my mouth shut in the hope of learning something about God's will, God's nature, providence, theology, theodicy, all the things that you gentlemen have discussed. But having seen you silence these theological wannabes, having seen you maintain your faith and yet come perilously close to assigning evil to God, or at least arbitrary capriciousness to God, I can't stand by and listen to that. What he says is this. He says, you are not righteous in the sight of God. No matter how righteous you think you are, compared to the complete, 
awesome, inscrutable majesty of God, you are not justified. The only way to justify yourself is to blame God, and that doesn't make any sense. By definition, that's contradictory, that's incoherent, and most important, it is blasphemous. Who are you to judge God? If God wants to send you suffering, he's God. If he wants to send you pleasure, he's God. In either case, whatever he sends you, it's the right thing to send because he is God. The idea that you should justify yourself at God's expense is the height of impertinence is a complete retreat from your would-be fidelity to the status of the deity. And in addition to that, it really doesn't make any sense. You yourself don't believe it, Job. If you had believed that God was blameworthy, if you had believed that God really was arbitrary, when you get right down to it, you would have blasphemed. You would have taken the route suggested by your wife, who's become in some ways a byword for lack of, of religious fidelity. She said, curse God and die. Well, Job, you're going to die anyway. In the long run, we all die. But the fact of the matter is that if you do anything except completely submit to the will of God and accept all that he sends you, both for good and evil, then you are a blasphemer and ultimately you are not a faithful man. You are not God's faithful servant. So Elihu, who has wisdom far beyond his years, and who has many of the qualities, apart from being described as an angel, sounds an awful lot like one of God's mouthpieces. Right? He has a certainly great religious wisdom here. Straightens Job out about this. And after thinking about it, he says, you know, you're right. I mean, there's no back and forth here. Elihu just comes down and lays the, uh, you know, the real theological facts on him. He says, look, God is God and we are not. In the, I mean, this is made very clear, actually, in a chapter 25 of the book of Job, which is, uh, the book of Job, for, incidentally, is well worth your reading. It's one of the books, I think, that is most wise in all of the Bible. Uh, it's not the only book that's worth reading the Bible. There's much wisdom to be gotten there. But when you do read the Bible, pay special attention to the book of Job because of its profundity. It makes you ask these kind of questions. And Job is silenced, which is a, a good thing. It's about time for Job to shut up. And perhaps it's about time for all theologians to shut up, which is part of the message of the book. Perhaps the whole idea of theology itself is presumptuous and a waste of time, if it's not blasphemous. Well, Elihu straightens him out. He says, look, the only way to justify yourself is to blame God. And that doesn't make sense. That means that you do not justify yourself. In the eyes of God, you're not justified. In the eyes of God, you are, it says in chapter 25, you are unclean like a maggot, like a worm, like a filthy insect. For you to judge the deity is the height of impertinence and folly. You don't judge God. Think of it this way. Um, think of it in, in ontological terms. Uh, those of you who have uh, studied philosophy a little bit or listened to lectures I gave on philosophy, I talked about ontology quite a bit. And ontology is the kind of logos of being. It's speech about being or about the gradations of being. And think of it this way. If we had a uh, an insect here, a, a caterpillar, or a worm, or a maggot, and we had God on the other end, and we had man in between, how would we parse these things? I mean, in other words, uh, think of it uh, like in Sesame Street, what is it Big Bird says? Uh, one of these things is not like the other, one of these things just doesn't belong. Well, which of these things is not like the other? Is God and Job, are, are God and Job very similar? Or are God and, or are Job and the maggot very similar? In other words, are we more like insects, or are we more like the divinity? Well, God made both insects and us, whereas we're, and insects and us are both finite and we're both limited, and we both really can't presume to judge God. In fact, when you look at it on the ontological scale of things, when you try and look at where we stand in the cosmic hierarchy of things, we have a lot more in common with a worm than we do with God. And for a worm to presume to judge God, or even to talk to you and tell you how to run things, is preposterous because the worm is so much below you and beneath you and outside of your status that the whole idea is preposterous. And the analogy is made in chapter 25 when he says, look, even the sun, the moon, and celestial objects are not clean, are not perfect, are not good in God's eyes. When we talk about the standard of divine righteousness, none of us are justified. None of God's creatures really match up to his standard. And the whole idea of any of his creatures presuming to, justi to, to justify themselves at the expense of the deity is wrong.
And that means that we should not seek after, out after self-justification. We should learn how to patiently submit to the will of God. In some respects, the worm is more virtuous than we are. At least the worm doesn't tell God how to run the universe. The worm, in fact, even if it's not conscious, doesn't try and be something that it's not. Whereas we would presume to judge the almighty, the inscrutable deity. How foolish, how presumptuous, how sinful. Perhaps Job has had a secret sin all along. Perhaps there's always been a sort of latent pride in which he thought himself justified and he thought that he deserved good things from God. Maybe the message here is that when we get good things from God, we get them as an act of free grace and we don't deserve anything. Hell, we don't even deserve to be alive. We don't deserve to exist. Nothing deserves to exist. The fact that anything exists at all is testimony to God's righteousness, to his power, and to his goodness towards us. The fact that we believe we deserve a continued series of good things is both foolish and ridiculous. And since we don't even deserve to exist from the very beginning, we have no claim to make on the Almighty, whatever he sends us, we ought to accept patiently and with great fidelity. We should not be a presumptuous worm. That's part of the book of Job, that we would learn our real status in the cosmic hierarchy of things, and that we don't try and outreach ourselves. That Promethean or satanic pride ultimately undermines our aspirations towards goodness towards virtue. Well, Job is now in a pickle. Elihu has quieted him down. Elihu has clearly won the argument. And it's clear enough that Elihu is not doing this the way, for the reasons that Job's friends are. Job's friends want to put God into a logical box. Job's friends want to make the inscrutable and awesome deity somehow reconciled with the very feeble and finite and limited mental abilities of human beings. What Elihu says is that that's just not possible. We cannot force the ocean into a teaspoon. We cannot force the mind of God into our own minds. The great uh, Russian theologian uh, Shestov once said that uh, God's reason and man's reason have as much in common as the dog has with the dog's star. Isn't that a beautiful line? <laughs> well, I think that's largely the message of the book of Job. God has his reasons if he exists because he's almighty and because he's inscrutable and because he knows everything. And whatever happens in the universe happens because he wills it and because he ordains it. And the fact that we don't understand why he sends it, the fact that we can't comprehend why our children should get run over or why earthquakes should kill people for no obvious reason doesn't mean that there isn't a reason. It just means we don't understand it. And the key thing here is that God is not under any obligation to make himself understood to us. It's not like we have some claim on the Almighty in which we can blame him for not explaining the universe to us. We're lucky to exist at all. We're lucky to be given the very small rays of understanding that we do actually get. If we are content with that and still able to affirm the world, still able to say yes to God, yes to his providence, yes to both the good and evil that we get sent. That is the authentic religious stance towards being. The complete acceptance of God's providence, regardless of whether we find it painful or pleasant, regardless of whether we find it comprehensible or completely incomprehensible. It's not for us to judge. If you believe in God, then it follows that he's all-powerful and all-good. And if he is all-powerful and all-good, and not a sparrow falls without his consent, well then, whatever he sends you is exactly the thing you should have, because, after all, he sent it to you. Complete resignation to the will of God is what this ultimately leads us to. Now, there's a beautiful conclusion to this story, and I think it's one of the most moving passages in all of Scripture and in all of world, religion, or all of world literature. After this colloquy with Elihu, Job is alone, and God comes and speaks to Job out of the whirlwind. And that's a beautiful image for the chaos of the world. Think of a tornado. God comes, and it's not a deus ex machina, the way we see in certain very inartistic plays or novels. It's not God from a machine. Rather, it's a deus ex natura. It's God out of nature, somehow out of the chaos, the incomprehensibility, the swirling flux of the world. God speaks directly to Job. It's a beautiful image for God speaking to us through 
the limitations in our understanding and knowledge. What a profound image. Whoever thought this up was a great genius of literature. Whoever in, in the ancient world managed to come up with this image, we owe him a great debt because it tells us something about our finitude and about our appropriate stance towards being if we are religious believers. God speaks to Job out of the whirlwind, and as you can guess, God is none too pleased. I mean, you wouldn't be, right? I mean, he's your faithful servant, and he's as good as people get, and you've sent him all these afflictions, and of course, being God, you have your reasons, and Job... He's been silenced, but he has been awfully self-righteous, saying that he didn't merit this suffering and such like stuff. Well, what happens here is this. God speaks to Job out of the whirlwind, and he asks him certain leading questions. He says, Job, I suppose you can guess who I am, right? And being a giant whirlwind talking to him, you can sort of guess who, would be, who that would be. And he says, I have some questions. Here's a pop quiz, Job. How do you make mountains? Can you make mountains? I make mountains all the time piece of cake. What's the recipe for mountains? Do you understand mountains, Job? <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, Job doesn't know how to make mountains, because he's a regular human being like us. We don't know how to make mountains. And he says, how about the birds of the air? Can you make ducks? I make ducks all the time. I know where they are. I know what they do. I know all about ducks. Fish, fish of the sea. How do you make mackerel, Job? Do you understand that? No, of course you don't. Why? Because you're Job. You're a regular, finite, limited, arrogant, prideful human being. And what's more, you're sinful, for all the above reasons, and probably some others too. I just don't have time to mention them. Let's get on with the story. Me, on the other hand, I'm God. And you know what that means? I know everything. I make mountains. I make mackerel. I make ducks. I make everything. I make the whole universe. I make the stars, the planets, the whole, the whole thing. I was here at the be beginning of, the, of time. Where were you? You were in my brain or you were in the mind of God. I was getting ready to make you. But I've been here from the very beginning. I create everything and I run the universe. Is that understood? In other words, no more insubordination from you. This is the way things are. I'm God, you're not. I speak to you out of the flux and chaos of the universe because I'm trying to make a point to the, to the world. Complete acceptance of my will is the only virtue. All arguments with me are essentially satanic pride. You know who argues with me? Remember the guy from the beginning of the book? Satan? Right, that's the kind of person that argues with me. And those followers of Satan who think that they can put me into their own logical forms. No way. I'm God, you're not, that's the end of the discussion. All your disputes with the deity, you lose. So why not stop disputing with me and come over to my side and do exactly what I tell you and accept everything I give you and stop complaining and stop trying to justify yourself at my expense because you're always wrong. Enough is enough, Job. And Job is thoroughly humbled. I mean, he'd been quieted down and forced to seriously reconsider his view of the world by Elihu. But God, he's a real convincing guy, especially when he's talking to you out of the world, when he straightens him right out. He says, look, I'm God, you're not. That's the end of all discussion. Don't dispute me. And Job says, you know, you got a point. I'm not going to dispute this anymore. Sorry. And God says, all right, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's no big deal. I was just trying to make a point. Notice he doesn't come and ask, you know, why was Satan up in heaven? Why were you talking to him? Why did you have a bet with him? He says, forget it. I don't ask any questions. Satan asks questions, and that's what makes him Satan. So I'm going to leave that alone entirely. So God speaks to Job out of the whirlwind. And the ultimate counsel that we get here is that we are not in a position to judge, or just, to judge God or to justify ourselves. It's presumptuous, it's ridiculous, and it's ultimately irreligious. Our stance towards being, if we are truly religious, is that of Job. The answer to the question, why does God send evil into the world, is, is as dumb as the question itself. Don't ask. It represents the level of intellectual sophistication that we see. Where, I mean, if you think of your six-year-old coming to you and saying, Mommy, Daddy, how come God let the goldfish die? Well, we kind of chuckle at that and say, oh, you know, don't worry about a kid. You know, that's just the way the world is. Well, when you extrapolate from that on a larger scale, why does God let children die? Why does God let nations die? Why does God let the evil sometimes prosper and the good do badly? Don't ask. It's like, why does God let the goldfish die? That's just the way the world is. If you believe in God, he has his providential reasons, and that's all there is to say. In other words, what I'm suggesting is that Job is the most anti-theological book ever written. And surprisingly enough, it ends up in the Bible. It says that real religious faith is beyond theodicy, is beyond theology. It, perhaps it turns out that theology is really a sort of disguised blasphemy, that we would claim to plumb the depths of an infinite ocean 
with our finite chords, really beyond human capacity. Now, at the end of the, the story, and this is kind of a, of a funny ending. I don't know quite how to account for this. God shows that he's really kind of a nice fellow, or God shows that he's really, in, really inscrutable. Perhaps the most inscrutable part of the book is that after God appears to Job in the whirlwind, and Job humbles himself and submits to the word of God and says, OK, I understand that I'm a worm, that I'm a maggot, that I don't presume to judge you. I get the idea. I won't do that anymore. I'm sorry. Then he says, OK, well, since you're sorry, I'm going to send you back twice as much money as you had before and twice as many flocks, and a new family, and a new house, and all kinds of great stuff. As a matter of fact, you're going to have twice as much of everything as you had before. So you get a happy ending to this. Now, I, I get the impression that this is tacked on towards the end. It's hard for me to believe that this is part of the original story. It's not easy to believe that we are supposed to, again, love God heteronymously. What Job has learned is that the love of God and submission to the will of God, if it is real and if it is authentic, is completely autonomous, has nothing to do with what God sends you. And once God makes that point and Job accepts it, then he's willing to send back good things to Job, perhaps as a kind of way of flagging our sagging spirit, or, 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 of uh, boosting our sagging spirits, or Job's sagging spirits, perhaps showing that he truly is inscrutable, that he sends and takes away for reasons that we don't entirely comprehend. And that if we are wise, and if we are virtuous, and if we are good, we will give up on all questions that are beyond our human capacity to understand. Now, two things I'd like to conclude with. First of all, we should consider the fact that Job only suffers throughout this impersonal evil. He never suffers the evil at the hands of people who are close to him, which is a different kind of suffering. But I assume that the, the nature of the story of Job, he would accept that, that kind of chastisement in the same kind of uh, faithful way that he accepted the others. And a second and final point that I would make is that while the book of Job, or the kind of deity that we see in the book of Job, is an indispensable aspect of Almighty God, it is not by itself sufficient. In other words, if, this, if, if all the other books of the Bible were left out and we only had this, well, I mean, I guess we would have to worship him since he comes out of the whirlwind and runs everything and all, but he would be an intimidating, awesome, frightening, kind of horrifying God because he does things for reasons we don't understand. He creates a moral order to the world, which really amounts to shut up and take it. And it doesn't give us that consolation, which is one of the important elements in religion and in kind of didactic literature. And I would say that that's one of the reasons why other faces of the deity are shown to us in other books of the Bible. Within Judaism, if you go and read something like the Song of Solomon, you'll see the kind of gentle, kind, gracious face of God. If you look at the New Testament and read something like the Beatitudes, right, you will again see the gracious, kindly, um, generous face of God, rather than the awesome, almighty lawgiver. And as a consequence of that, it seems to me that the book of Job is important and could never be left out of biblical literature because it is an indispensable tonic to a certain kind of whining to a certain kind of self-pity. And for that reason, it is one of the great contributions to the wisdom literature of the world. And if, in fact, it's not the only face of the deity, it is one of those faces of the deity without which our understanding of God's will and God's world would be incomplete.